call the meeting to order on this wild and woolly wet evening at district headquarters. We're always praying for rain and we're getting in abundance right now. So welcome everybody. Thank you for participating and attending. Um, I'd like to ask the district secretary to please take the roll. Okay. <clears throat> Directors Gunther. Akbari. Here. Vaughn. Here. Weed. Here. And Sethi. Here. And Director Gunther ha has uh, informed me that he will be a little bit late to the meeting, but he will be present. And so I'm going to call on a staff member this time for our salute to the flag. Ms. Hydas, would you like to guide us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And at this time, I'm going to ask the general manager to take us through some housekeeping uh, affairs here. Thank you, President Sethi, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the ACWD Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome the public's participation in this board meeting. My name is Ed Stevenson, and I serve as the district's general manager. Members of the public may participate in this board meeting in person or remotely by either using the Zoom application or by telephone. Any member of the public present in person who wishes to make comments may approach the speaker's podium at the appropriate time. For those participating remotely, note that the meeting materials, staff reports, presentations uh, for this meeting are all available on the district's website at acwd.org. You may reference the instructions at the top of the agenda for how to participate using the controls in the Zoom app or your dial pad if participating by telephone audio. This board meeting is being recorded will be made available to the public for future viewing. And that completes my housekeeping remarks. Thank you very much. Um, we're down to item three on our agenda, which is public comments. Members of the public may address the board on any issues not listed on the agenda, which are within the purview of the Alameda County Water District. A five minute limit is customary. However, as board president, um, I may adjust the actual time allotted to accommodate the number of speakers. Members of the public who wish to address the board on a scheduled agenda item will be given the opportunity to do so when that item comes up. Any members of the public present here in the boardroom that would like to speak first? By my Seeing count, uh, President Sethi, all the participants in the boardroom are staff. And so do we have anybody online that would like to speak? See Mr. Nishimura, please uh, go forward. Thank you. <clears throat> Members of the board. Members of the board. After reviewing the agenda for this meeting, for this I noted with considerable disappointment a lack of an item to review the district's current drought surcharge. Current drought surcharge. As of now, California of has now, received California well over the normal amount of precipitation the for the year. Even if the skies were to clear for the remainder of the season, we would still be substantially above average. Yet, the district refuses to place an item on the agenda to review the drought surcharge, even in the midst of yet another atmospheric river event. Alameda County is no longer in drought, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor. Effective March 1st, our neighbor, East Bay Municipal Utility District took the responsible step of removing their drought surcharge, which, by the way, was only 8%, roughly half of ACWDs. Enough water has flowed through Alameda Creek in January and February to meet the district's entire water supply needs many times over. I suspect when this atmospheric river event concludes, another year's worth of water will flow past our noses. What does it take for the district to realize that maintaining a drought surcharge under these conditions calls into question the credibility and transparency of this agency? Why is there not a standing agenda item to review the surcharge at every meeting? Is this a means for the district to collect additional revenue under false pretenses? At a previous meeting, Director Weed mentioned that the district had collected revenues above expectations. Where did that money go? 
I urge the board to seriously consider the appropriateness of continuing to impose the drought surcharge and take steps to rescind it as quickly as possible. If the district needs additional revenue, make the case in an open and public forum. Don't hide behind a drought which no longer exists. Thank you. Thank you very much for the input. I don't see any other uh, attendees online that wish to speak, so we will close the public comments this time. We'll move on to item four, the consent calendar. And I would invite um, additions to the consent calendar from the action calendar. I'll make the motion to add items 5.1 through 5.10 to the consent calendar. Um, we're going to um, exclude, I'm sorry, we're going to exclude um, 5.2. Director Weed needs to recuse himself. Got it. Okay, so I'll, I'll amend. All but 5.2. Okay, so I'll, I'll amend it to add items 5.1 and 5.3 through 5.10 to the consent calendar. I'll second. Call the roll. Directors Gunther, Akbari. Aye. Juan. Aye. Weed. And Sethi. Aye. The director Weed, you wish to recuse oh, yourself? Oh. Well, first I'll, I'll make the oh, motion. Oh, yeah, to, um, uh, as amended. Yeah, so I'll, I'll make the motion to adopt the consent calendar as amended. Thank you. I'll second. We'll call. Directors Gunther, Akbari. Aye. Juan. Aye. Weed. Aye. And Sethi. Aye. So, Director Weed, you wish 5. to leave, 2, the, I, leave the room? I'm a joint tenant in a property which is in the vicinity of 500 foot limit of required recusal. So I will be leaving the room. That project is rubber dam number three and the property going tenant in is on Chase School. Thank you. So with uh, 5.2, I'd like the staff, staff to just give a mini version of their um, report. It's quite lengthy here in, in the board packet. Um, and I would like it mentioned explicitly what the damage was to rubber dam number three that occurred. Thank you. Sure, we can, uh, this uh, item is resolution finding the repairs to the groundwater recharge facilities damaged by severe winter storms, exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act in approving the project. And we can provide a very brief Cliff Notes version uh, of a description, Mr. Owell. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Good evening, board members, uh, staff and community members. As the board might remember, um, in late December, early January, we had severe uh, winter storms, atmospheric river, uh, caused damage to several district facilities. Some of those facilities include uh, groundwater recharge uh, facilities, uh, the ponds, as well as the, the creek facilities. One of those facilities is the rubber dam number three um, a dam, the dam itself, the rubber fabric, which was torn by those severe uh, flooding events and um, what we have here before the port this evening is approval of this project, the entire project, which will be a repair of these various facilities and and uh, for the uh, for the board to consider that the uh, district went through the environmental clearance process and have complied with legal and uh, regulatory requirements and, and um, uh, the specific damage to the rubber dam is that it was torn um, and um, we are working with uh, uh, the contractor that uh, supply or the supplier that uh, provided the material and the co contractors that will help us with repairing uh, this particular facility. Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer um, any questions uh, or concerns. Well, I, I have a um, question comment on uh, the related item of 5.3 on the Vallecitos channel, we have a cost estimate of what the uh, repairs are going to be. 
but I did not see that on item 5.2. There's no estimate, and I know that's a pretty expensive project. Could the staff provide an update, if not now, at a future meeting? Sure, yeah, we'd be happy to um, yeah. if the if staff didn't have a lot of detail right now. Um, 5.2, of course, is just CEQA. We wouldn't normally go through the details of each project. 5.3 has to do with services um, needed to address the channel, so it's yeah. more specific to a project. Um, but uh, we actually don't expect the rubber dam three repairs to be tremendously expensive. It's not like we have to replace the bag or anything, at least we don't think so at this time. It's more of a, a repair project. It won't be free, but we don't expect it to be a significant expenditure. All right. So um, I'll, I'll move um, for the staff recommendation here. A second. By Director Akbari. Um, Directors Gunther, Akbari. Aye. Juan. Aye. Weed and Sethi. Aye. So we'll invite Director Weed back into the boardroom, please. Welcome back, Director Weed. At you. this time, we're going to move on to item 5.11, which is awarding the contract for the Alameda Reservoir roof replacement project. Okay, and for this item, I'll also turn it over to our Director of Engineering and Technology, Mr. Wolk. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Once again, good evening, board members, um, staff, and community members. This item is for the board to consider a contract, construction contract award to uh, Thompson Builders, uh, which is one of the proposers or the bidders on this project. I will give a brief synopsis of what the project entails, as well as um, uh, something that's unique for this particular project, uh, and I'll take questions as appropriate. Uh, staff this evening is requesting board approval for uh, three particular items as it relates to the Alameda Reservoir uh, roof replacement project. Uh, this uh, is one of the uh, mission critical facilities for the district and the roof on this facility, particular facility is not seismically fit and that this project will uh, make appropriate replacements. Um, and to that extent, we are asking the board to approve um, the lowest bidder for the project. There are two minor irregularities that <clears throat> staff worked um, through uh, over the last couple of weeks, and those have been properly, properly corrected by the bidder. So we're asking the board to approve those uh, irregularities, as well as award a construction contract. And what's unique uh, as a third item this evening is we're asking the board to authorize the, G the general manager to approve change orders up to 7% of the contract value, which is consistent with uh, established district performance indicators for CIP projects. Now, uh, the reason for this change order approval ahead of the, um, the uh, change orders uh, is, is uh, several um, fold, but I will mention um, a few of them. One of the reasons is a time is of the essence for this project. And, and this reservoir serves a critical purpose in balancing water supply and mul uh, supporting multiple pressure zones. And the sooner we complete this project, and avoid delays the, the better for uh, the district. And in order to do that, we are asking for uh, the board to approve a 7% change order, which will be um, the amount of uh, $1 million, uh, $1,235,511. With that, I will read a summary of uh, the staff report and recommendations. And uh, we'll be more than happy to answer your questions if there are any. <clears throat> 511 resolution awarding contract for the Alameda Reservoir Re Replacement Project. Uh, the Alameda Re Reservoir Re Replacement Project consists of seismic, structural, electrical, and mechanical improvements to the Alameda Reservoir in Fremont. 
including new insulated roofing and metal deck over timber framing, concrete lateral force resisting elements and fans, lights and associated power and controls. Three bits were received, opened and evaluated. The low bid contained two minor irregularities that may be waived. Is adequate funding in the capital improvement program budget for this expenditure. The project together with staff's recommendation related to authority for change order execution was most recently reviewed with the engineering and information technology committee on March 1st, 2023. Board authorization of these services will help meet the district strategic goal 1.1 efficiently manage and maintain our infrastructure to ensure reliability. With that, I'll read the recommendation from staff. By motion one, waive the minor irregularities in the Thompson Builders Corporation bid. Number two, adopt the resolution awarding the construction contract for the Alameda Reservoir Re Replacement Project to Thompson Builders Corporation in the amount of $17,650,150. And three, authorize the general manager to execute change orders up to 7% of the contract value in a total amount not to exceed $1,235,511 to address unforeseen items that may arise during construction or job number 21292. Thank you. So um, I will first like to ask if there's any members of the public that feedback on this. Not seeing any, so I will go to the end of the board and welcome comments from board members. Uh, question, you mentioned the term metal deck. That is standing same metal roof. Can you repeat the question? I a standing same metal roof for panels that are longitudinal and they, uh, they have a, about a two inch projection. Is that the type of roof you're talking about? Um, I believe that that's the case, but I would have to go back to the plans. In, in my, my point being that there's been some interesting work development of solar panels that are compatible with standing seam metal roofs. And that in laying out the project, if you, it may be worthwhile to take a look at the ability to make the additional additions that are really lightweight solar yeah. um, fabric that can be put on a standing seam metal roof and clipped onto the risers so that it doesn't rest directly on the roof itself. Yeah, what I can tell you is the design uh, has accounted for the solar panels that will be installed on the on this facility, because we knew that was one of the, the sites for the district clean energy uh, program. <laughs> so it will accommodate the solar panels on top of the roof, uh, as you indicated. Okay, so that's part the of the question. design, although not identified here. That's All correct. Right. Thank you. Sure. No comments. Um, I'll just make a, a quick comment that um, Director Gunther and I had a chance to do this project in depth at our last engineering and IT. So I'm I'm happy to to support it, um, and I, I'm going to be um, interested to see kind of how the uh, approval of the contract order up front will help kind of expedite. I'd just like to check. I, I obviously I'm late. I'm sorry uh, for being late this evening. Um, we did go over this item in committee recently, and I'm just going to ask staff: Were there any major changes since the committee meeting? No, same approach. Same, same. Yeah. Okay, the only, what you. we've done since then is just firm up the approach to ensuring that we're regularly reporting to the board those changes that are they're approved by the GM, and they'll be in the board packet on a quarterly basis as it stands now. I I, I fully support that. Um, I also um, support this project, and I will note that um, when we first were putting in these roof replacement projects in our CIP 10 years ago, we were talking about 5 to $8 million roof replacement. Now we're more than double, almost triple what those cost estimates were, but those were at the bottom of a recession coming out of a recession. So it's kind of alarming to see the costs going up so much. Um, I am not required to recuse myself on this because my prop, my home is not within 500 feet of the property, but just like on the 
pump station that Disney is working on on Kirtner Road, I'm going to abstain and vote because a project of this significance, which may end up closer to $20 million, can affect property values in the neighborhood. And I'm kind of on the borderline uh, in distance to the reservoir. So um, we'll vote to abstain, but not because I'm not in favor of the project. I just don't want to have a conflict of interest. I'll move staff recommendation. Second. Director Gunther. Aye. Akbari. Aye. Juan. Aye. Weed. Aye. And Sethi. Abstain. We'll move on to uh, item 5.12. This is authorization of construction management and inspection services for this very project, the Alameda Reservoir Roof Replacement Project. Again, I will be abstaining on this. Okay. Um, yes, you're right. It's the same project. And just, just for the record, I have in my notes that um, Vice President Sethi, or Gunther arrived at 614 p.m. Um, but for this item, we will again ask our Director of Engineering and Technology to give us a quick review. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Good evening, board members, once again. Uh, this item, as you indicated, relates to the previous item. The previous item was for the actual construction, the physical work of the construction. And this is for the support that we need as the uh, work requires oversight, management, and inspection. And we have put out solicitation for um, uh, consultants that perform this type of work. Uh, we got responses and we selected uh, the consultant that's uh, better positioned and well qualified to do this work. Uh, without further ado, I'll just read the summary of this uh, uh, staff report and the recommendation and I'll take any questions you may have. Uh, the, the Alameda Reservoir Roof Replacement Project consists of structural, electrical, and mechanical improvements to the Alameda Reservoir in Fremont, including new insulated roofing and metal deck over timber framing, concrete lateral force resisting elements, and fans, lights, and associated power controls. A large component of the work will require knowledge and expertise of reinforced concrete with framing, roofing, and seismic fastening and detailing. To help ensure compliance with the contract, construction management and construction inspection services are required. Is adequate funding in the capital improvement program for this expenditure. The scope and uh, need for construction management inspection services were reviewed with the engineering and technology committee on March 1st, 2023. Uh, board award of this agreement will help meet the district strategic plan goal 1.1 efficiently manage and maintain our infrastructure to ensure reliability. And staff's recommendation is by motion authorize the general manager to execute a professional services agreement with Kennedy Jenks Consultants Inc. An amount not to exceed $1,112,646 for construction management and inspection services for the Alameda Reservoir Re Replacement Project, job number 21292. Thank you. Are there any uh, public comments? I don't see any. Um, director comments start at the end of the board. No comments from Director Weed, Director no. Wong. No comments. Good. Okay. I will make a, a quick comment from a historical perspective, because I'm very proud of this. Um, my father, as, uh, as an employee of the district in the engineering department, was one of the designers of this reservoir in the late 60s. And uh, I happen to live in the neighborhood as a beneficiary of this reservoir. And I remember sitting at my dad's drafting table as he was working on these things at home on the weekend. And in addition, uh, this reservoir is not named after Alameda County or the Alameda County Water District. It is named after a very important member of our community, Tony Alameda, who was one of the founders of Washington Hospital and on the original board, school board director for a long time, and he was on this very board as well. And in our history book, there's a delightful 
photograph of uh, the commemoration dedication of this reservoir where um, Mrs. Alameda's wife is cracking open a bottle of champagne like on, on a ship that's embarking for the first time. And it, it's a, uh, and I, I knew both of them very well growing up because I lived next door to his uh, son and uh, the children that I went to school with all the way through high school. So uh, it brings back a lot of memories, both personally and our family and otherwise. I just wanted to mention that. So uh, could we have, could we have a motion here. The motion passed, uh, staff recommendation. I'll second. <clears throat> Um, just a quick comment. We may want to acknowledge that this is an individual and not an area and the official descriptions of the reservoir itself. As we talk about the Alameda Reservoir. Yeah. yeah. Putting the, the T Alameda versus Tony Alameda would be a uh, informative. Uh, the Anthony Alameda Reservoir. So. Um, have a record yeah. party made the motion. Second, Hunter. Director is Gunther. Aye. Akbari. Aye. Juan. Aye. Weed. Aye. And Sethi. Abstain. Thank you. Hope you don't mind me sharing a little bit of history. The <laughs> recommendation you didn't have to vote for it. <laughs> At least I didn't ask for a renaming of the reservoir <laughs> to my father's name. All right, so item 5.13, authorization to execute a memorandum of agreement to participate in the Regional Purified Water Pilot Project Phase 2, public outreach and grant funding opportunities. And uh, we have a staff presentation on this. Uh, I will ask Ms. Heides to uh, kick us off here. Great. Thank you, Director Sethi. Um, so to, as, as the board's aware, the district has been cooperating with a number of agencies in the Tri-Cities and the Tri-Valley uh, on the potential development of a regional purified water pilot project. And based on the results of an initial feasibility study, the six agencies have expressed interest in moving forward with a phase two of the project. Uh, which would focus on public outreach and education efforts and identifying and identifying some potential grant funding opportunities. So we know the board had a lot of interest in um, more detail on this project. We talked about it in January and tonight we're back to be able to share some more information. And um, so in order to do that, we've got a uh, staff presentation ready to go here. And so, and before I kick it over to uh, Mr. Neither, I also wanna acknowledge um, Kelsey Oshiro, who's online, one of our um, water resources engineers who's been working on the project. And also, I'd love to um, turn it over to Thomas Neiser, who's had a long history with this um, concept and is here to make a presentation and share more. Great, thank you. Um, so I was not here in, in January. I was uh, buying myself down in Mexico, uh, but I did watch the video. Um, and um, what we decided to do is just to uh, sort of overview the topic once more. Um, it, we provided some FAQs to the board. I think those are those to the public as well, or is that just a communication to the board? Okay, so we've prepared some responses to uh, sort of a summary of questions that I heard come out of the discussion in January when I watched the video. It's great having those videos, by the way. Um, and so what we have here tonight is really, um, frankly, it's the presentation that was done in June of 2022 to overview the project uh, when this was first presented to the board. We're going to kind of go through this again and then speak a little. I'll go through it fairly quickly uh, and then we'll sort of speak to some of the greater concepts and some of the questions that we heard. Um, skip over those abbreviations. So to recall, the district is has been participating in this regional purified water study led by DSRSD for several years now. Um, the regional partners include a number of Tri-Valley uh, community uh, members, uh, LAVMA, Wastewater Management Company, uh, City of Livermore itself, Zone 7 Water Agency, and then here at home, uh, Union Sanitary District, who's been our partner in studying recycled water for 
30 years uh, is also part of the study because of the nexus with the uh, ACWD USD concept. And what came out of those studies was this very highly feasible concept uh, that really just involves ACWD and DSRSD. What that is, is to uh, build a, and here I'm talking about a pilot, should step back a touch to say there is a big potential concept here. And the, the big concept would be to take advantage of US, uh, DSRSD's existing infrastructure uh, where they had built a purification plant and um, sort of rejigger that and use that to produce a purified water source for potential delivery to any one of numbered locations. DSRSD studied putting that into Lake Del Val, uh, into the groundwater basin. But in the interim, um, because that existing facility is situated right next to Alamo Canal, which leads to Alameda Creek, uh, we came up with this idea where that purified water could be discharged into Alameda, into the watershed, flowed down the existing infrastructure they have there into Alameda Creek, and then down towards ACWD's existing recharge facilities where we could take advantage of that water and recharge, use it to supplement recharge of our groundwater basin. Uh, there's a lot of positives of the project. Primarily, it's very low capital costs. Uh, so you're really primarily just looking at feasibility. And we know from our own studies that capital is typically about two thirds, maybe even 75% of the unit cost for a recycled water project. So it's got a lot of good checks on it, but it also has three functional uh, beneficial uses of water. Uh, one would be a reduction of net discharges to San Francisco Bay of only secondary treated wastewater. Second would be the potential to provide uh, in-stream flow enhancement, which could have environmental benefits. And then third would be water supply. So the concept itself has, a, I like the term, a bit of a halo around it in terms of uh, hitting multiple beneficial uses. Funding potentials is huge. Uh, it's already been supported by the regional board um, in terms of DSRSD's own uh, operating permit as well, which is um, remarkable. Which is remarkable. So the uh, but we you know we can't just go out and build something here and, and really DSRSD is looking at a long term use of that water probably in the Tri Valley. So there's an interim opportunity to do something together with us. Maybe it could be longer term, but it's just an opportunity. So what we proposed is why don't we put ourselves on a track towards building a small pilot project, very small that we could run and operate and use this as an educational facility, but also to collect environmental data on that water in the stream. And the reason you need to do a pilot obviously is because we always would do a pilot before building any big project. But the main thing is about education, public education towards the use of uh, recycled water. So in a, in a nutshell, um, a, a pilot concept of a very small plant, 0.2 MGD, plant uh, located up there at DSRSD's facilities to discharge water to for delivery to Alameda Creek to our recharge facilities. So uh, as I mentioned, the public outreach and education is, is really the, the main thing the uh, pilot would be about to demonstrate the technology, to collect data, and to promote regional collaboration. The um, Cost to do a uh, full pilot. This is not what we're proposing now, by the way. The cost for that full pilot would be about two, three million dollars, including all the operating expenses. This is no grant funding assumed, no cost sharing. This is just the total cost estimate. So what we're thinking right now is that um, this is again, this is from June 9th, so I wanted to emphasize that. So in June 9th, we were proposing these next steps to develop a, an MOA amongst the regional partners to further work on this. And I wanna point out that ACWD has not spent a penny on any of this work to date. It has been completely funded by DSRSD and the other partners in the Tri-Valley. So we've been a complete beneficiary. We've contributed some, some in-kind services in terms of staff time input uh, well, and concept development. Uh, but what we'd like to do is develop this public outreach materials. And what we're thinking there is, um, some professionally developed 
uh, PR materials coming from a uh, public information and relations firm that specializes in recycled water. So find a good consultant, develop some informative information, maybe a nice trifold, perhaps a, a PowerPoint presentation or some animations and, um, and use that to do some outreach, including some public meetings. So our staff, DSRSD, we would do some meetings out in the Tri-Valley down here Get that information out to the public and see what the feedback is from the community about development of a potable reuse of recycled water. This is actually something that ACWD is very much behind um, on doing for itself. And that's exactly why we want to get involved because after we're done with our current local study, that is one of the key recommendations is that we start getting this information out there to the community. It's not saying the district's going forward to do this. I'm talking about our local project is to get out to the community and say, hey, this technology is out here. We have this capability and let's start shaking the tree a bit and see what what falls. We may get positive feedback from the community. We may get concerns and all of that will be information to give us direction for the long term. And the idea here for ACWD now, not this pilot, is that we still are looking to recycled water as our next source of supply. And we never know when that time is going to come. We're planning on it a couple decades out, but we have substantial loss of imported supplies. This is the next thing in line. And we want to get the community started in this discussion, get their acceptance for it long before we consider spending real money on a project. Um, and the poster child, of course, for why you have to do public outreach is DSRSD itself. The existing facility they have, they built in the 1990s, they did very limited public outreach and information sharing. And we're pretty much ready to start injecting that water into the aquifer. And then the public found out and they had some different opinions. So this is the, the poster child for why you have to get way ahead of developing a concept like this and bring the public along with you before you overcommit resources to it. It's also why we get a benefit from a very low cost concept. If we were to do something with DSRSD, they have the building, they have the piping, the electrical work, they just need to update their, their membranes and it could be fired up in a very short order. So coming back to what we want to do here and why ACWD would take the lead in doing this PR part. Well, first of all, like I mentioned, we haven't spent any money on this yet. We've made a very small contribution. And so when there was a request for partners to provide in-kind services, we offered up the PR because we are going to have to do it ourselves. And frankly, it's a bit selfish. My desire is if staff can work on this project now with DSRSD, we're going to pre-vet the best PR firms out there because we're going to hire one ourselves. We can uh, develop material in concert with other regional partners that has a lot of consistency in the theme and the messaging, which is what we're trying to do throughout the region including San Francisco and San Jose purified water. Um, and it'd be partially funded by, or mostly funded by the other partners, not even by us. So I think it's actually probably gonna save us money when we get around to doing our own program. So in, in a way it's sort of like buying a bit of an education, but, but on a discount. So that's what our philosophy is behind this current proposal. Um, and the idea is if we develop that material, we go out there, we start learning, we start building public awareness. Meanwhile, we're going to look for funding. And because of those three beneficial uses of water, we get to get funding from three different buckets for those three different purposes. So the probability that it could be very highly funded is high. And like anything else, we're not going to pursue something unless it makes sense. So we, there's no plan to proceed on to an actual physical pilot unless we have that support for it from the commu community as well as uh, uh, ample funding to make it make sense. So that's in a, in a nutshell um, what we had proposed. Um, see if I got anything else here that I wanted to mention. I think I got it all. I didn't even look at my notes. Um, there were some questions that we put in the FAQs. Um, well, maybe we should read the next slide. Uh, step, which is the uh, recommendation for tonight. So the recommendation for tonight is by motion to authorize a general manager to execute an MOA to participate in the regional purified water pilot project phase two public outreach and grant funding opportunities. That's it public outreach, developing the material and look for grant funding to, to pursue a pilot. 
So with that, uh, I think we'll open up for questions and I would like to extend that to include the FAQs, which the board received. I'm sure you all read and digested and uh, so any, any questions? If I may, um, <clears throat> I, I would actually like to start off the discussion. It's okay. So, um, I think it's been well established that I do not believe in recycled water for our community. I stated this from the time I was first elected. And the reason is because, not because I don't believe in recycled water for communities where it makes economic sense. I do not believe it makes economic sense in the Tri City area, Presently, although it yeah. has value in the Tri Valley area, Amador Valley. Um, and seeing Santa Cruz, other communities where it is uh, um, a valuable resource. However, I have always supported the prior studies that the board has done. First one was $250,000 with USD and then a subsequent one that ran a few hundred thousand dollars. And I always expressed that the reason I supported the studies was because we do get uh, public uh, questions surrounding recycled water and water purification. And the result of those studies was uh, very similar that it is potentially the most expensive source of water that we could have for our community. But I believe having the facts after doing the studies is really important for us to showcase to the community. So you heard my comments in um, uh, January. I was a little concerned about us taking the lead on this and that by take, putting our toe in the water, it would lead to commitment or an obligation for project funding. I see that clarified in the staff report tonight. Glad to see that. And uh, I informed our general manager that after a lot of consideration, that uh, this is a nominal expense and I will support the staff. You, you really desire to see the results from this. Um, it appears that there's a, um, a movement in California in general just for the grant funding for projects like this. And so I wanted to go first here tonight because I think the board heard well my concerns in January, but upon reflection and everything, I will vote to support this project. Well, and having watched the video, I'm sure you heard my concerns at the, uh, when this first came up. I would note when it was once uh, proposed and I supported at the time, a pilot study programs, just a study effort for a ultrafiltration plant and rebuilding of Mission San Jose water treatment. We were into it for $30 million before we pulled the plug. It was just a study. It was the one no vote and finally got five votes to support me in pulling the plug later on, but I got trapped into the study. The major cost of a facility is in the operations, not, not the construction. It's a long-term cost. We had an earlier study that showed a far more localized recycle, just came out recently. Been in our recycled water, been in our IRP, our integrated resources plan for the, some 20 years. It showed that the cost of a USD relief local was six to thousand dollars an acre foot to eight thousand dollars an acre foot three times the cost of our most expensive water probably about six times the cost of our average water supply and moreover with recycled water it's built into your base you have to spend the money on that most expensive water first before you look at the other supplies so it doesn't make any sense from a business standpoint there are also issues related to liability with recycled water, which are evolving with some of the proposed contaminants, 
which may well be byproducts that will be regulated by CERCLA and could make it extremely expensive. This is a proposal to release water, product water, which is too warm or fairly warm into a watershed, which is also a great majority of the Alameda Creek watershed is too warm to support ocean going fish. So there's no environmental benefit to species. Water we capture, they're limited on the times of the year when we can take water from Alameda Creek and we can operate our dams. So then you have only a small fraction of the time. This keeps coming, the cost of the water and the water itself keeps flowing on an annual basis every day. You're only gonna get a small percentage of that for beneficial use. Supply, if you capture it after it's come down a 20 mile open channel. De minimis is too strong a word. It's beyond negligent for benefits to our district. The, I fear that once we get into a public debate on toilet to tap, uh, in this area, you're going to find a huge backlash that will expand beyond that topic into other issues related with the water district, and we'll lose some of our, much of our credibility as a district. The, we're going to take the lead in the PR why? And if you're going to find a beneficial use for this, the only thing that makes sense is not putting it into an open channel, but to put it into a pipe that those in the Tri-Valley area, which may have a desperate need. Also, we have an alternative water supply, which is brackish groundwater, or the San Francisco Bay, which is an unlimited supply. The environmental community and the Democratic Party wants to push recycled water over desalination because they've been erupted by a no growth element, which is really anti immigrant They want no development. They don't want people coming in because that allow unlimited growth because they don't know who those people are. Participating in this, I think would be fortunate and um, something that we should terminate and we should remove recycled water from the next edition of the IRB for Alameda County in its entirety. So, so I think there is an agreement that at this point in time, with what we know, that recycled water does not pencil out for Alameda County Water District. I think that that's a factual statement based on staff recommendation. Correct. But what's before us today is just the outreach component for this pilot project. I think, unlike Director Wee, I'd rather not assume to know what our customer wants regards to recycled water. I see this outreach as an opportunity to get a temperature or get a sense from our community how they feel about this whole project. Yes, there is definitely the potential for this to open down other Pandora's boxes, but in my personal opinion, I think that's perfectly fair. If our customer has concern and if this leads us down to other paths, so be it. But I rather hear from our customer on how they feel and use this 25K is a very small amount as an opportunity to actually reach out to our community using this little pilot project saying, how do you feel about this? Because that has to play into our consideration, right? Even if it pencils out with some grant assistance, for example, financially, we still need to <coughs> get a sense from our community if they will even accept this project. So this is for me, is a very small price to pay to actually have that conversation with our community members to get their temperature, see how they feel about this project. So. That's definitely, from January, I think it's very clear that I definitely support Recycle Water, water Project, that that's a personal thing, but just focus solely on this particular item. This is an opportunity for small cost to actually have a conversation with our community on how they feel about Recycle Water. So I would definitely be supporting this project. So, you know, when I first got elected to the board, I think, it's well known that I was a lot more bullish on recycled water than, than I am today, certainly. And, and much of that is a result of getting to review the reports that were mentioned that show that 
for us, it would be uh, too expensive and, and it just doesn't pencil out. Um, so, uh, you know, I've certainly changed my opinion and, and thinking on that, but I do still support the recommendation tonight because like Director Huang mentioned, um, it's a good opportunity for us at a very low cost to just understand public sentiment around this project um, and, and have a little bit more data in our back pocket. And we're talking about $25,000, which in the grand scheme of things um, for us is, uh, is a low cost, but could uh, yield some very interesting results for us. So uh, I'm going to be supporting and voting. I could add one quick Part of my problem is not the 25,000. I could even possibly support giving them a check for $25,000 to look at recycled water in the Tri Valley area. One of the fundamental problem I have is our maintaining a relationship with this consortium and being part of the consortium. That's where the future entanglements and liabilities lie. And recognize this 25,000 we give to uh, a variety of causes over year over the years don't necessarily have any net benefit to our district measurable benefit but it's the partnership that really bought much well i'm not worried about the partnership um great up this project is about a public outreach grant funding opportunity we're not talking about putting money to the plan over there, we're not even talking about supporting recycled water. Now, it's in our IRP, it should be in our IRP. Because if you don't put it in your IRP, anytime you go before somebody in the state, you're gonna run into trouble. Because has been stated, yes, a lot of people in the state think this is the answer. We've done these studies and we found that for us, it's not the answer. Maybe this will work for the valley. Sounds like it might. But if it does, chances are we're not going to get a whole lot of this water anyway. In which case, we're going to get the benefit of knowing what our public, hopefully with some degree of what our public thinks about this. They may absolutely hate this concept. Which case? Well, maybe we want to rethink. But at least there'll be some education to it. Because everybody thinks it's the greatest thing since sliced bread until you have to do it. The cost is phenomenal. Um, it hasn't made sense. It hasn't made sense for 20 years. It's still 20 years out. We shouldn't drop it. We should keep it where it belongs. And where it has belonged has been 20 years out. We don't know what's going to happen 20 years from now. Um, you know, ask us 20 years ago what type of cell phones we would be using today. They're talking. Well, yeah, Paul might be able to tell me that. But, you know, it's, I think it's money well spent. Get an idea. I, I actually am not completely in disagreement with Director Weed about being involved in this sort of because they may want they may think we want to give money to this plan. But sounds to me like there's really not a lot of benefit water coming from this plan because they're going to use it. But there is possibility of getting good data from what our customers because there is a chance this may go down the creek. I'm fine with it. By the time it leaves that plant and gets around the corner it's not going to be any more potable because it's going to mix with the stuff that's in the creek. That's just reality. Um, <clears throat> there's plenty of animals between here and there. Um, as far as the fish go, there have been some studies that indicate that maybe the fish can handle a little warmer water than they think. Most studies with fish, I remember seeing this a few years ago, were done with cold water fish. And they were finding that the fish that live closer in to the have adapted to handling the warmer water. But I'm not about to put warm water in the creek that's going to kill the fish, but I don't think anybody else is either. <clears throat> These are things that we're going to find out if we participate in this. And if they, if by being involved in it, 
if they're going to build it and they do want to discharge to the creek and it is going to impact the habitat, then we need to know about it because we're spending a tremendous amount of money. We just have, excuse me, on fish ladders. And we're going to continue to spend money, has been pointed out over the years, running those fish ladders. So I'm in favor. It's about pilot project, public outreach, grant funding opportunity. That's the item. Or is the plant nice concept? I think I don't know. But I also don't live in Dublin, San Ramon, and I'm not on their board. Not my problem, right? Could be my problem, particularly if it's going to harm, do some harm to it. I don't think it is. But for tonight, I support. So um, let me go back and see if there's any public input. Seeing none in the boardroom, is there anybody online? Let's see, Tanisha Murr, like to speak? Please go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm pretty much in alignment with uh, directors Akbari, Gunther, and Wong. Um, I believe that the item that is immediately in front of the board is whether to spend $25,000 to support a public outreach uh, or you know, gauge the public's uh, opinion regarding the potential use of recycled water. Um, while I do agree with uh, the, the statement made by most directors that at this instant, recycled water may not be economically the correct choice for the district, I see no reason why we should give up this opportunity to keep that option open, right? The district has prides itself, and the district staff, I should say, prides itself on its meticulous planning capabilities, right? They, will, they can analyze the economic pros and cons of one source of water versus another. That is an analytical mathematical process. The big variable in this is the non-analytical, highly emotional human reaction, right? And unfortunately, well, maybe ChatGPT can tell you, but right now you can't put human reaction into an Excel spreadsheet. You have to go out and poll for that. And because of that, I see this as a very low cost opportunity to get that critical data that you can't get by, an, by rote analysis. If it turns out that there's a, a serious negative public reaction, that gives you that input that you need to say, not only do I have to look at the economic cost, but I also have to look at the public relations cost. Now it could be 20 years into the future, the situation changes and that recycled water either becomes a mandate because of the source, you know, the supply of water or economic conditions have changed. And having this data today will help you build the process necessary to make that transition. So the way I look at it as a member of the public, what are you afraid of? Uh, this is relatively minor expense to gain a lot of insight into something that you probably want to have in your arsenal of knowledge. So as I, I do support this, uh, you know, it, if it means, if after this, it means that you don't want to continue down this path, that's fine, but at least get the information. And I agree that this is probably the cheapest way you're going to get it in this partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your comments are appreciated. And I see um, Kelly A would also like to contribute his thoughts. Please go ahead. Thanks. Um, so I've got two two uh, thoughts on this. One is uh, this: um, the uh, state or the the urban regions seem to be um, oftentimes they get uh, locked into this uh, uh, these high cost sources. Uh, so they go off and you know do moonshots and uh, uh, you know nuclear reactors or whatever it takes to to get. Uh, to get water, uh, desal, whatever, um, and, and the cost is very, very high. But uh, the, you know, if you look at the overall water use in the state, um, the people with established water rights, they they kind of uh, they don't uh, they don't get suckered into the this uh, this uh, this, and they they uh, 
they hang on to their low cost water and uh, you know it's the urban areas that have to pay the high cost but uh so you know the, that's not uh, that's not not to say we shouldn't be doing this project this project um is you know it's a fine little it's a fine pilot project and it might even be a fine full scale project who knows um but it does it does say that uh that the uh you know the the overall uh you know the if we if we only if we confine ourselves to worrying about the highest cost uh, uh new sources of water and uh and never look at uh, other you know other users with the low co low low cost sources of water we've got to then we're missing the, most of the water and then also on the, my second thought on this is the uh um if you look at all the people that are involved in this project um they're you know the political problems aren't aren't really going to show up uh, aren't really showing up in all these different places you know in all the different uh all the all the different communities that are on the on the slides um if you look down in Los Angeles, they the uh, Orange County, Los Angeles, they've got a couple of these kinds of uh, projects running, or build, or they're building some, and they're fairly large ones, and they're not getting, uh, they're they're uh, they're moving along, and they're, the the political problems they seem to have those uh, under control. But in our region, um, the the uh, main source of political opposition to this uh, is uh, is very simple. It's three words, well, one word. It's Pleasanton. Pleasanton has thrown a fit about this stuff, and they they don't like uh, potable reuse, and they've uh, they're they're uh, you know uh, they're holding their breath and stomping their feet, and um, you know maybe if uh, if we kind of you know hold their hands and and kind of proceed uh, along and be uh, and and move calmly slowly, uh, maybe we can uh, get them to uh, to uh, to uh, you know grow up. Thanks. Thank you very much. The city of Pleasanton is also going through a conniption fit right now in regard to PFAS in their wells. So they've got their arms full. Um, I'm going to close the public comments at this time and ask if there's a board. Option. I'll move staff recommendation. I'll second. I'll call. Director Gunther. Aye. Akbari. Aye. Juan? Aye. Weed? No. And Sethi? Yes. So, that was a, the longest discussion I can recall having for such a minor experience. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you come back with all the results that we pray for. Okay. So, we'll move on to reports. Are there any directors that would like to comment on? One of the board committee reports. Not seeing any, any members of the public? Not see any operational reports? I only asked for one update, the most re recent rainfall report information, if we have it. Are there other requests from the board? Seeing none. Yeah. <laughs> um, see a hand up, Mr. Nishimura. I I believe we're at the operational reports. I was going to comment a, a little bit about the distribution hardness. It seems like we have gone up substantially from what we have been tracking. Uh, large portions of the district are above, uh, slightly above 150. Uh, is it? Due to the fact that the water that we're getting from SFPUC itself has gone up in hardness, it's usually down below 20, and it's now up in the 80s, uh, which indicates to me that they have switched their local source of supply to, uh, or the source of supply to the local reservoirs as opposed to the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. Um, is there any? Uh, action to be taken or is this a, a temporary uh increase in the hardness and is that uh, should we expect that to come back down thank you yeah we can provide a little bit of a uh, round that information out a little bit mr Ahrens. yes thank you mr stevenson and mr anishimura you are correct that is the cause uh, sfuc began going on local supplies late january so february is the first full month um, of seeing higher hardness coming from SFPUC 
That will continue. They plan right now to go back on to Hetch Hetchy approximately March 29th. So most of March will also be high. So next month report will be very, very similar to this month. And then come April, we should see more uh, usual hardness coming from SFPUC. Now again, lower blender hardness throughout the distribution system. Mr. Aaron, um, could you help to elaborate on the also the uh, repairs that Hetchetchi is making that you know from the meeting that I had with them on on the street where they were dumping thousands of gallons of water out. Yeah, this this is a annual outage as their their mountain tunnel project this is actually associated with them fixing their mountain tunnel, which is their main uh, pipeline coming down from Yosemite. So this year it's a sixty day outage approximately. The next, I think, at least two years or ninety day outages. So about this time next year and the following year. There will also be an outage where it will be on local supplies, and those actually be a little bit longer, and they're projected to be about three months, as opposed to this year's two months. And that's just so they can make major repairs and upgrades to their mountain tunnel pipeline. Yeah. So uh, just to better inform folks here, I um, uh, noticed a large team of people working full time around the clock on recent weekend on Warren Avenue, where they were um, releasing large volumes of Hetch Hetchy water down into the sewer. So I stopped uh, to inquire about what they were doing and the foreman who works in Sonol uh, for SFPUC showed me the maps of what they're doing and everything. I happen to have my ID with me so I could look legit. And uh, so I, I talked with the team for half an hour and uh, uh, what they disclosed and they they showed me the map which was really interesting so they are um uh releasing all the water from irvington tunnel near mission san jose high school uh 8.2 miles all the way down to calaveras road and that pipeline is not a linear pipeline with natural gravity flow it goes up and down in spikes all the way through the hills and uh, and so that was really a uh, um, good illustration for me of how this pipeline works. There's a couple of pipelines there, as we know, but they are draining the 92 inch pipeline, the huge one. So they can actually do a visual inspection and drive through the tunnel um, with small vehicles. And they are looking for the, the repairs that are necessary um, uh, because they they fear that they're reaching end of life on the on the pipeline, and so uh, they actually shut down the southbound Hetchetchy water going all the way to Valley Water District. They've kept our northern pipeline that runs across Mission and Hopkins out to Newark alive, so that we're tapping into that pipeline. And that's where we're getting our, our Hetch Hetchy water. So um, yesterday I was at our LVE meeting and uh, um, Mr. Ritchie, the general manager of SFPUC Water said that uh, this is actually quite an expensive project that they are working on. He's looking forward to us paying for those repairs through our increased water rates. <laughs> For the bonds that will be issued, um, but this is not a light exercise. And Mr. Aaron's was able to provide some information afterwards to me that this is a multi-year effort. That the pipeline is being shut down for these periodic reviews, and um, Director Weed also saw them uh, dumping large volumes of water um, near uh, Mission San Jose High School recently. So this is not a small undertaking, and they are going to be uh, closely inspecting the whole pipeline and looking for where they have to make repairs. Um, just a quick note of clarification. The mountain tunnel for the Hex HG system is up near Groveland. It's a long run, and it's in a potential state of um, 
collapse of collapse, which would be a major shutdown should that happen for up to six months of the Hetch Hetchy system. And they have a potential program to replace, to repair it. This is the Irvington Tunnel, which goes from Sonol and comes out above Mission Tennessee High School. Prior to the WISIP program, that had been a single tunnel, which uh, had not been expected for almost 50 years. So one of the advantages of having the parallel tunnel as part of the $6 billion water supply improvement program, which was really deferred maintenance, um, the, um, was that they could do these type of inspections. What I find curious is they did not provide a provision for capturing the water that was um, left stranded in the tunnels and are putting it in fire hoses that are then sent to a storm drain as they drain it out over a extended period of time because there's a lot of water. It's actually a belaboring effort because if you look at the map of the pipeline going like this, um, the water cannot just be released by gravity. It has to be pumped out in the sections where it's trapped. So that's what they're doing right now is literally using high pressure to force the water out of a 92 inch pipeline. So. <laughs> Don't be surprised if you see a billion dollars added on to the, um, the water supply requirements of San Francisco to take care of the mountain tunnel, the not too distant future. More than likely. Okay, so let's close that discussion. Um, is, do we have any additional rainfall information? I saw we were 25 inches at the end of February. We're right at the inflection point of the 82, 83 storm year where we shot up dramatically. It looks like with this set of storms coming through, we're gonna. Been a lot of water, very impressive. And actually we have a bit of a rainfall update in the next presentation. Uh, well, uh, in the drought update under uh, general manager's report. So that's coming up. Okay. So let's move on to item 6.3 staff presentations. We have Mike Hollowell here, his famous annual presentation. Don't we'll look forward to. How are you, sir? Just fine. Thank you very much. Good. Okay, maybe Good I can back. pass it over to our director of water resources to get us started here. Great. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. So the Replenishment Assessment Act of Alameda County Water District requires the board to order an engineering survey and report on groundwater conditions, which was ordered by the board on November 10th, 2022. Uh, and this is the first step in the process to establish a replenishment assessment for the next fiscal year. While the district monitors groundwater levels and water quality through a number of programs and regulatory requirements, the survey report on groundwater conditions and groundwater monitoring report are both prepared specifically to comply with the reporting requirements outlined in section seven of the act itself. Recommendations in the survey report on groundwater conditions are based on projected activities needed to sustain the groundwater basin in fiscal year 2023-24 with consideration of groundwater levels and quality documented in the 2022 groundwater monitoring report. Tonight, Mike Hallowell, senior engineer, is presenting information on the Niles Cone Groundwater Conditions and Survey Report to assist the board in its review of the two reports received by the board on February 9th, 2023. Eileen Chen, Groundwater Resources Scientist and author of the Groundwater Monitoring Report is also here tonight. This is Mike's 32nd year authoring the survey report and Eileen's 19th year authoring, authoring the Groundwater Monitoring Report. I'd like to thank them both for their, dedicated, for their dedication to these efforts. I'd also like to acknowledge Michelle Myers, Groundwater Resources Manager, who's here in support of tonight's item as well. And before we begin, I'd like to note that tonight's presentation happens to coincide quite appropriately with National Groundwater Awareness Week, March 5th through 11th, which is an annual observance established to highlight the re responsible development, management, and use of groundwater, and to encourage yearly water well testing and well maintenance. So now I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Hallowell to make his presentation. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Uh, good evening, members of the board, executive staff, members of the public on behalf of my colleague, Eileen Chen, and our manager, Michelle Walden. Uh, thank you for allowing this uh, presentation to supplement our two uh, recent uh, annual reports on the groundwater basin. Uh, the monitoring report and the survey report work together to uh, document recent groundwater conditions 
and, and then project recharge needs for the fiscal year in the interest of ensuring ample supply for pumping wells and uh, as a minimum prevention of new seawater intrusion. Our work to uh, supply and protect uh, this intensively utilized groundwater basin uh, occurs through uh, facilities, operations, access to imported water, planning, and engineering. Uh, the cost for this is a basis for staff's recommendation on the rate of replenishment assessment, which of course is the per acre foot charge for uh, groundwater pumping. A recommendation for next fiscal year and its supporting rationale will undergo a public hearing on April 11th. Uh, if the hearing can be completed that evening, then the board could, as early as that same evening, then move to adopt the resolutions that will set the replenishment assessment uh, rate effective uh, July 1. But should the board find itself needing more time to consider public comment, the Replenishment Assessment Act would allow um, the um, hearing to be uh, uh, up, up to the first Tuesday of May for the hearing to be completed and the second Tuesday of May uh, for uh, the board to adopt the resolutions. As in uh, previous years, we'll uh, touch on uh, uh, basin conditions and then get straight away uh, to the uh, uh, finances and uh, staff's recommendation um, on the RA rate. Um, this work is made possible through the expertise, uh, guidance, and contribution of the Finance Department, the Water Supply and Planning Division. And we'd also like to acknowledge our groundwater resources technicians for their work in the field and on GIS to bring us the latest groundwater conditions. But before presenting anything on salt, uh, or brackish water, we'd like to clarify that we do look out for our groundwater quality issues other than seawater intrusion. Through our groundwater protection programs, uh, we uh, collaborate with the Regional Water Quality Control Board to ensure the investigation and cleanup of any um, releases of hazardous substances at industrial sites. We've investigated nutrients. We have an initiative on forever chemicals. And we're planning a presentation this year at a water uh, resource Water uh, Resources and Conservation Committee meeting to discuss some of these things and also to uh, discuss uh, the occurrence of manganese and dissolved oxygen from a, a basin perspective. Um, when we refer to the groundwater basin, of course, we mean the 107 square mile Niles Cone, uh, which is uh, hydraulically uh, subdivided by the um, Hayward Fault into two subbasins. We have the above Hayward Fault to the east, uh, the below Hayward Fault to the west. Uh, from the early 1900s to about 1962, uh, the basin was over pumped and the uh, below Hayward Fault side uh, suffered seawater intrusion. A cutaway view, uh, water from San Francisco Bay entered the Newark Aquifer and then that brackish water made its way landward as groundwater in the Newark and then uh, moved, its, moved downward through natural weaknesses in the aquitards and through abandoned wells to impact the Cinnable Fremont in deep aquifers. Uh, this happened because overpumping caused uh, the Newark aquifer levels to drop below sea level. In 1962, it was at 70 feet below sea level. And in that year, uh, brackish water in the Newark aquifer had enveloped about 60 square miles. Um, but the early 1960s did mark a turning point as uh, the district gained legal and institutional means to put into place some effective sustainability measures. Uh, we've got the Replenishment Assessment Act, which among other provisions required metering of wells and enabled a replenishment fee structure. Uh, about that time, we got access to imported water. Uh, we um, added additional or converted additional quarry pits into recharge ponds. And uh, to get water into those ponds uh, more efficiently, we installed impoundment and diversion facilities. We expanded basin-wide um, monitoring and instituted a program to regulate construction and destruction of wells and borings and put into place other critical groundwater and watershed protection programs. Groundwater levels responded uh, with the Newark Aquifer returning above sea level uh, by 1972. Uh, under contemporary operations, we do like to see, get groundwater levels up to the upper part of our operating range, thereby um, reducing the amount of uh, imported water we might otherwise need in ensuing dry years. With a Newark aquifer above sea level, uh, the natural uh, flow direction is bayward, so uh, we've and which has helped to repel brackish water. So we've gone from this in 1962 to this today with. Uh, 
continued improvement observed each year. For the Sunnival Fremont Aquifer, uh, unlike the Newark, we estimate that the worst year for salt was not 1962, but probably the mid uh, 1970s. Uh, improvement since then uh, has been uh, seen not so much by a shrinkage of the brackish water area, but more by fading of concentrations motivating us uh, to use a chloride mass of the brackish water zone as our metric for comparison. And we see that uh, uh, this suggests that we're about 46% along, along the way to a cleanup goal, but to address uncertainty in this uh, methodology and verify progress over the last 10 years, we've considered uh, chloride trends in individual monitoring wells. Uh, and we've converted the, the slope of the trend lines into a, uh, from milligrams per liter per year into a, a percentage and then plotted those percentages as point values um, on a map. Uh, and uh, we can get a geographic sense of how the aquifer is behaving. And with the uh, negative numbers dominating over the positive numbers, we, this, this tells a good news story. Uh, similarly, we have that also in the deep aquifer, although not as dramatic, uh, and there's not as much data there. Um, stabilization. Improvement in water quality in the Central Fremont and deep aquifers is attributed to improvement of the overlying Newark aquifer, a sealing of abandoned wells, and extraction of uh, brackish water uh, to supply the desal facility, uh, which removed 3,500 metric tons of chloride last year while providing uh, high uh, several thousand acre feet of high quality water to our distribution system. Uh, of course, uh, extracting water um, from ACWD wells and um, private wells together uh, has to be replenished, which brings us to recharge needs. To deliver the survey report on time at the February board meeting, uh, we needed to work on the basin balance in December. Uh, without advanced knowledge of the, uh, of the uh, coming atmospheric rivers, uh, we um, Thought it was prudent uh, to assume that the winter of 2023 would be similar to the winter of 2022. Uh, the state at the time was uh, promising only 5% of our state water project allocation. So we assume that uh, any imported water needed for the groundwater basin would have to come from semi-tropic. And with our groundwater model, we did uh, verify that 3,800 acre feet of imported water would be need needed to keep groundwater levels reasonable for this type of hydrologic condition. So um, with reference to our two um, indicator wells, uh, we projected levels with our model, uh, the red line out to 2024 for the above Hayward Fall indicator well, below Hayward Fall indicator well, we um, modeled that the water level in the, in the indicator well would get to, to within about six feet of sea level before popping back up. Now, because of the incredible winter we've had, the actual levels are the green dots in, in 2023. And which is a good news story. Uh, so we don't anticipate needing the imported water this summer after all, but we could need some later in the fiscal year because we really don't know what 2024 is gonna do yet. With understanding that operationally, uh, the district will optimize uh, imported water uh, scheduling to real time conditions. The survey reports one and a half year uh, outlook remains a reasonable basis for purposes of the replenishment assessment. Whether or not we end up taking the imported water, we'll still need to pay uh, fixed costs for our uh, contracts with uh, the State Water Project and uh, Semi-Tropic Water Storage District. Uh, the variable part for the uh, 3,800 acre feet is about three quarters of the dark blue uh, pie slice and a small sliver of the uh, light blue slice. So that's uh, 910,000 from semi tropic and about 212,000 uh, from the state water project. State water project costs are mostly fixed and uh, on the entirety of the, of the light blue slice should be offset by the state water project override tax. The 3,800 acre feet, um, along with about 16,000 acre feet of local water, uh, would be replenished into the basin through our recharge facilities the operation of which is a uh, recurring uh, expense. Um, and, and as are um, our groundwater protection and monitoring programs and admin in general. Pending a new two-year budget, uh, we priced out recurring expenses and the capital uh, with the documents that we have, the capital existing capital improvement program, the existing uh, budget, 
Uh, most of our time on this is spent going through the budget in very granular detail to isolate costs for those items, those activities that benefit the supply and the quality of groundwater in the basin. So um, things like, so only th those types of you know, cost of benefit of the basin are represented here. Uh, items for the distribution system, such as our production wells and the desal facility are not included herein. And we look at revenue the same way. If we were a replenishment only district, our revenue would be uh, replenishment as assessment uh, revenue, the 1% tax, the state water project override tax and grants. Uh, per the Replenishment Assessment Act, uh, the proposed rate adjustment applies only to groundwater pump for purposes other than agri and, re and municipal recreation. So to be fair to private well owners who would pay at this rate, we evaluate pumping for ACWD's distribution system using the same rate, and in this case, the proposed 538, and carry that resulting revenue, 7.5 million into the revenue stream. So what that would mean is that uh, because the district would pump 93% of pumping for purposes other than ag and municipal recreation, the district would effectively pick up 93% of the replenishment assessment. When we added the rest of the revenue, we project a total of about 22.2 million, which is short our cost total by 1.2 million. Uh, but this is just one year in a multi-year uh, cash flow, which very importantly has a long look backward uh, with actual costs and revenue updated through the last uh, fiscal year. And the unending balance of that is carried forward and applied to uh, projected costs in our analysis, uh, thereby providing a moderate moderating effect on our RA rate recommendation and ensuring its fidelity to actual costs um, as we march through time. Uh, based on our current outlook, um, the proposed 4.9% adjustment uh, would get us close to the uh, FY2324 projected cost and put us in a good jumping off point to track with plausible costs over the next uh, 10 years, including projects such as Valacillos Pipeline, which is the, the bump that you see out there in 2030, uh, as well as initiatives to ensure long-term reliability of our uh, sources of replenishment water, uh, which are challenged by uh, climate change and uh, environmental and regulatory uh, pressure. If the board were to agree with the proposed $538 uh, an acre foot for FY2324, the year over year rate of increase since 1997 would be about 3.5% per year. Last year's rate adjustment was 2.6%. Orange County Water District and Valley Water are two uh, other California water districts operating groundwater basins and urban environments. They have a replenishment act similar to ours and um, operating recharge facilities. Uh, and um, in an urban environment. So um, I don't want to overstate the comparison and RA rates with um, these agencies, but um, because every uh, basin has its own unique issues, but um, in, in case it's of some interest, um, we went and updated the slide. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mike, I, I feel like I just listened to a, a great symphony in oh. every single note. Time. Thanks. It, it's always a joy uh, listening to uh, have to present. You do it so uh, remarkably, precisely well too. So um, do we we don't need to take any action tonight. This is just information, right? And we'll come back on in April next month, which is a Tuesday board meeting. As a reminder to everybody, not a Thursday meeting, once a year. And uh, then we will consider the adoption of the resolution at that point. Thank you, Mike, for an excellent presentation. And I have other comments from the board. Uh, yes. Well, first of all, thank you for um, establishing some, some metrics for how we're doing and what our ultimate goal is. What water analysis do we do for the replenishment water that we're putting in the in the, in the system? Uh, well, we have our, even as far as measuring water quality of the water in the recharge ponds. We're putting in into the recharge. Yeah. Okay. Well, we do have our Alameda Creek monitoring station. Um, and this um, other staff want to comment on the, uh, on that. Um, we've um, also, um, I think that includes some nitrate, nitrogens, but I, I, I'm out of my, 
an area right here. So I'll uh, we measure for, for yeah. emerging contaminants. Um, let's see, um, emerging contaminants. Um, we have had the gamma program before that's gone around and looked at various things like um, you know, all kinds of, you know, in terms of, you know, like things that you might find in wastewater or things like that um, some time ago. Um, but we'll have more about that in a, in a committee presentation. We'll certainly include that. But um, I, I don't think our, our watershed is, as I understand it, is fairly pristine, um, except we do have PF, you know, there is that concern about the forever chemicals, of course. And um, uh, as far as regular types of monitoring of, of that, I um, uh, I know we have our, our Alameda Creek monitoring station and um, occasionally there have, been, there have been special studies done um, Ad hoc, but um, that's that's we're, we're having to deal with some significant <clears throat> uh, contamination forever chemicals that are not native to the um, groundwater basin. Has there been any effort then, as part of your program, to determine that we are not compounding the situation with our recharge program? Um, well, I, Michelle, if you want to comment, uh, that's fine. Yeah, and we, we, so director, we just to real quick answer your question about other types of monitoring. We do have a number of uh, routine programs in the creek and in the watershed that we do uh, some basic water quality parameters. We do have a number of special studies, like Mr. Howell talked about. Um, and as you mentioned, with forever chemicals, we have some specific things going on, uh, and we'll be looking at things. Um, but that's not a focus of what um, uh, we're talking about tonight. No. With the Historically, assessment. And, but, uh, and Ms. Ms. Walden might have some additional comments as well. All right. Yeah, when it comes to the forever chemicals and, and looking at um, PFAS specifically, we are doing a regular monitoring. And so far, everything's been pretty consistent. I monitoring mean, of what? Of P the different PFAS suite. Um, I believe we're using the testing method that we are in our production wells as oh, well. The, well, that's of the water that's there, but I was thinking of the replenishment water we're putting in. The question is, my concern is where are the forever chemicals coming from that have contaminated the significant contamination? There's ongoing research water. regarding that. So that's where, as part of a replenishment effort, mm -hmm. fee, I would hope that we could incorporate that into the cost of trying to maintain the uh, groundwater is. basin. It is. Um, I, I think we're going to take a deeper dive into the PFAS issues uh, later on. But, so, okay. Um, I would hope as this evolves, that we look at a also a, re, a rethink of the basic way we operate our groundwater basin the use, the ability to use groundwater for other than potable uses, non-potable uses, which would not require the extensive treatment that our um, current groundwater might. That would be um, also help us in our disaster preparedness and that we could identify locations where we had, we could do, uh, fill up a fire truck, provide water in times of emergency for other than potable uses, fire flows and sanitary flows. Um, and it may help us out in the long run. But if we could written, it would be a basic rethink of how we run our business, our, our district and use the reliance on $2,500 an acre foot treated water. Director Wong, do you have any comments? Director Corey? Other than the wonderful report as usual, thank you so much. I always look forward to it. Thank you very much. Very kind. Thank you, Mike. And I don't see any other hands up. And I um, would like to entertain taking a very short break. It's welcome by yep. other people. Ten minutes, no more than that. We'll come back to general manager's reports and director's reports after. Okay, I'll hand it off to our general manager for the GM's reports. All right, thank you, President Sethi. And our first item tonight, 6.4.1, is our drought update. And I will toss it over to Ms. Heides just to get us started quickly. 
Yeah, just a, a brief intro. We've uh, had another short drought update on the agenda tonight um, to just provide the latest and greatest. And of course, now March is off to another interesting start. Um, so uh, we're just continuing to uh, roll with all the variety that uh, 2023 seems to bring this year. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Leonard Ash, our water supply supervisor, who's here tonight to give a um, brief update. Thank you, Ms. Heides, and good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to provide uh, yet another drought update uh, on the latest with our uh, water supply situation, as well as uh, precipitation conditions across the state. I'll start with local rainfall, and I'm sorry, Director Gunther, I don't have the latest rainfall figures as of five minutes ago. Uh, but as of this morning, uh, for this water year, our local precipitation gauge has measured 25.8 inches. That reflects 3.7 inches that fell in February, as well as 1.27 inches so far in March as of this morning. We're over 25. And uh, because the wettest year, 1982-83, uh, was mentioned earlier tonight, just wanted to note that we are 66.34% of our way towards matching that record. For statewide conditions, as of today, for the Northern Sierra uh, eight station index for precipitation, uh, they come in at 45.8 inches, and that's 119% of average for this time of year. And then the US drought monitor that we've mentioned several times is a, typically a, an agricultural indicator uh, for Alameda County, we're now in the abnormally dry category, so not in the drought designation. 26.8% uh, of the state is now uh, has no designation at all, whereas 34.17, including Alameda County, is abnormally dry. 24% of the state is in moderate drought, and 24.9% of the state is still in severe drought. And again, the latest map you can find on the website uh, listed there. For statewide reservoir conditions, again, as of today, Oroville is 75% uh, full, which is 116% of average for this time of year, whereas Lake Shasta is 62% full, 83% of average. St. Louis Reservoir, 83% full, which is 100% of average for this time of year. And Lake Oroville has uh, an elevation as of today of 838.59 uh, uh, feet, uh, which re reflects two. 0.658 million acre feet in storage as of midnight last night. For water supply updates, uh, with the uh, current atmospheric river event arriving today, uh, we expect a flurry of activity as we look ahead to some updates that we'll receive in April that will be very determinative for uh, the water supply outlook uh, for this water year. Uh, so in early April, we anticipate snow surveys, both from Department of Water Resources, as well as with San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And as you recall, uh, April 28th was the date that the governor put in their latest um, executive order requesting recommendations from state agencies regarding state actions uh, for drought, uh, for the drought emergency declaration. And then April 15th is the date that we expect a water supply availability report from the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission to their wholesale customers, which includes ACWD. So if you look at our water supply updates right now, you don't see a whole lot of change here beyond what you've uh, read in the minutes from our last uh, report to uh, the Water Resources and Conservation Committee. Uh, but I would note that those April dates uh, do have the potential to impact uh, our imported supplies for sure. And obviously, as we see continued rainfall in our local area that continues to positively affect our, our groundwater recharge abilities. Uh, I would note that uh, breaking news today, uh, the State Water Resources Control Board did issue an order modifying an order that approved the temporary urgency change petition that EWR and the Bureau of Reclamation had submitted uh, to modify their uh, permit requirements and for water quality, uh, Delta water quality uh, parameters that they would have to meet in February and March. So those changes effective uh, for uh, March onward for the remaining portion of that uh, that approval. So that we still have yet to see how that will shake out and affect uh, the state supplies, but we expect that uh, because of the state board's action, there'll be slightly less uh, state water in storage as a result. 
Uh, next, I would uh, just uh, continue to commend our customers for their continued great efforts to conserve water. You can see a very, uh, very flat line, green line there reflecting uh, that our customers continue to conserve. And this is exactly in line with the 15% uh, request that this board has issued in December 2021. <clears throat> And then for the precipitation outlook again today seems to be a, another day of, of great news and activity. Uh, the National Weather Service Climate Prediction Center uh, issued a notice today that La Nina has ended uh, and we're uh, resuming into more neutral conditions. Uh, obviously, this is a, a, this neutral status gets us away from the uh, variability that we come to expect from La Nina conditions and uh, leaves the door open for a potential trend towards wetter conditions of uh, um, El Nino. So uh, those neutral conditions are expected to continue in the northern hemisphere uh, through spring and early summer of this year. So we'll continue to watch that. That'll obviously have an impact, uh, uh, not so much on summer precipitation because there isn't much here, but it will it will be an indicator of uh, where we where we expect to to watch any uh, changes in those uh, forecasts for the fall and how it might affect next water year. Uh, so for the precipitation outlook, uh, obviously there's a lot of green on these maps and, and the current versions that you can find online uh, continue to indicate that there are increased probabilities for above normal precipitation in uh, Northern California, but across the state, uh, both on the six to 10 day outlook, the eight to 14 day outlook, as well as the overall March uh, monthly outlook. Uh, for the three month outlook, that's March, April, and May, uh, they they take a, a more conservative approach and just say neutral chance neut um, neutral conditions uh, equal chances for uh, normal conditions or above or below normal. So it looks like uh, right now, obviously with the with the atmospheric river event that we have right now, as well as more rain that's predicted in our near term forecast, uh, we expect March to uh, to to have uh, very favorable conditions, which can only possibly affect our uh, current water supply situation. So, as Ms. Haida said, it's a very brief update today. Did want to highlight for the board that April expects to be a very busy month with uh, a lot of uh, announcements and, and latest information that we get, which obviously will affect the outlook for the rest of the water year. But uh, much improved conditions and uh, water supply planning staff, uh, as well as other district staff, will continue to monitor this situation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the board? Any from the public? Seeing any? Thank you very much, Mr. Ash. Right, thank you. Wonderful presentation. So we'll move on to the next of the PM reports. Yeah, the next item is 6.4.2, and that's vacancy on California Special District Association Board of Directors. I think the board's aware um, that, uh, that there is one vacancy available on this uh, CSDA board. This is a seat that uh, is for the Bay Area Network. It's seat C for a three-year term. The, current, the seat is currently vacant. And so CSDA is preparing to do their elections. Uh, and I wanted to, as discussed last month, I wanted to ping the board and see whether there's interest um, from any member of this board to potentially run for that seat such that uh, if there is, then we'd prepare the necessary uh, resolution for next month so that we can uh, proceed with the election process in a timely way. Um, if there if there's interest by more than one person, then we would prepare the resolution in a certain way. If there's only interest by one person, it'd be easier to prepare that resolution. And if there's no interest by anyone, uh, then there will be no item on the agenda next month for this uh, seat. So wanted to take this opportunity to just look for nodding heads or levels of excitement. I'm not seeing that right now or, or or any questions that there may be item csda has some strengths but to attend one of their board meetings or one of their conferences and have every single speaker be a motivational speaker you have to wonder <laughs> um about the uh general philosophy and guidance of the i'll pass Director Akbari, no interest? I, you know, I, I did. This would be a good opportunity for an up and comer. Um, yeah, I think the, uh, the requirements are a little extensive. 
I think there's, it, I don't know if it would be possible for us to us after. Sure, remain available. We've uh, got a little time before the district has to take some action. So I have, uh, uh, I think some no's and maybe one maybe. Okay, so that, unless there's any objection, then I think we can work with that to uh, <laughs> prepare for next month. Who's going to put his hand up? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I had this guy. Okay. okay. I definitely have more, enough on my plate, so yeah. I'm not volunteering for anything. Uh, by the way, we also have uh, the Region 5 elections coming up. There's a schedule on that. Posted by Aqua, so maybe we might want that. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of time on that. Um, I have a schedule that kind of lines these up, so I think we'll be okay. But uh, um, I think the time for nomination starts in early April. Uh, but the deadline, I think, is we have time to work yeah, within the deadline. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. I didn't want to inundate you all with lots and lots of opportunities. So. I just wanted to raise it so other people are aware of it. Which one was this? I'm sorry. Well, they're having the board of directors election for Aqua, and then they have all the region oh, nominations yes. coming up this spring too. Well, I'd be interested in the region five again. Yeah. Okay, it sounds good. Yeah, I was <laughs> asked to consider participating on the uh, nomination committee. And I suggested I may end up having a director on our board that may want to run for the position. So I declined to get on that, uh, that role. What role? The Aqua Region 5 nomination <laughs> committee. Right. So who pre who prepares the slate of candidates? And I see. Yeah. Okay. I have uh, another couple of quick items under general manager's report. One is a one of those asks for forgiveness instead of permission. Although I did consult with our president and vice president before doing this, we've signed on, I signed on to a bit of a coalition letter uh, providing some comments and responses to a recent technical order issued by the Department of Drinking Water uh, that contained uh, new requirements for uh, a lot of new reporting. Uh, and the, the exception that, uh, that we took in this letter was much of that reporting is already being done in a different format for different state agencies. Um, and there's a, a lot of a, um, new frequencies of data submittal requirements. So, um, so there are discussions going on between uh, Aqua subcommittee and this coalition and the division of drinking water. We wanted to try and offer suggestions for how that technical order may be modified. And this is not legislation. And it's not, um, you know, uh, formal uh, regulation that comes out through a public process. This is a technical order that added these new requirements. So I just wanted to let you know, um, my name and our logo is on this letter. Um, and so you're not surprised if you see that bubbling up. So. Uh, and then lastly, we heard already that this is Groundwater Awareness Week and our public affairs and water resources staff uh, took this as an opportunity to kind of uh, get some groundwater awareness going out there. And so we're kind of piloting an approach with Newark Unified. And this week, uh, staff participated in sort of the science classes, the seventh grade science classes for uh, 12 different classes um, uh, through the week, touching about 300 students. And it was a great program so far. It's been good news that I've heard back from it. Uh, it was basically a education. It was awareness about uh, groundwater, the water cycle. There were some hands-on activities. Uh, and, um, and so we're really happy with how that turned out. But I just want to give you that quick report in terms of what we've been, one of some of the things we've been doing, groundwater awareness week. Okay. Uh, I, that's all of my general manager's report, unless there are any questions. Questions? Okay, so we'll start in on director's comments. Item 7.1, Director 
Reed and I attended the Cal D cell conference in Sacramento, the end of the conference. Director Reed, do you want to go first? Oh, um, fine. It, was, it was an excellent conference, um, growing their number of, it's a conference which has a number of innovative industries involved. They're trying to do somewhat pilot projects, much of a coastal. Um, and uh, even Tim Quinn was assigned now working with a company that designing, proposing to put T-cell packages at a depth of about 450 feet below sea level, using the water pressure to be able to run the water through the filters and then bring it on shore. So it's an innovation there. Uh, we're floating offshore uh, 4,500 acre feet which at Alf Vandenberg, which coincides with the amount of water that Vandenberg is subcontracting for the state water project. So, in lieu of the water project. And there was a presentation called Ice Pigging, which is putting an ice slush into a pipe, pushing it through for scouring and cleaning. And it came to mind today when I received a complaint from someone in the um, Niles area that we've been doing some flushing of our mains, water in their uh, sink and tub had turned brown. That's the disturbance of the sediment. One of the arguments of the company that was putting the ice picking is greatly reduce the amount of sediment that the uh, various customers see in their own home and that you can use it through a butterfly valve, not restricted to some of the strains. That may be something we could uh, at least evaluate, and we've done it in the past under evaluation, but it's under implementation. Um, so this is my help. All right. Um, uh, Let me add one more. Yeah. It was a presentation by the um, Poseidon uh, on their large desalination facility in San Diego County and noted that the regulatory bureaucracy is costing them $600 per acre foot, over and above the cost of uh, building and operating their uh, desal facility. So, thank you. Let me just note that uh, a dozen years ago, when Director Weed and I first attended the annual Cal Diesel meeting, we only had about 20, 24 people. And uh, each year it's grown. And uh, according to the uh, um, event host, they said they had 160 people registered for this conference. We were literally packed like sardines in the room. And uh, it's nice to see the growth and the discussion of not only uh, ocean water desal, but brackish water desal. And I, I just wanted to highlight a few things. First of all, uh, the innovations in desalination segment, I really enjoyed. Uh, there were six presentations each 15 minutes. It was like a venture capital forum. Everybody was giving their 15 minute elevator pitch on their company and it was rapid fire and it was it was absolutely excellent. And I know our general manager was an, one of the organizers of the conference, although he was able to attend. Yeah, that was a real drag to miss it. I knew it was gonna be um, somewhat different than prior conferences too. In fact, there was so much material we had to kind of pack them into two different sort of trains. Uh, so uh, yeah, there was a lot going on. This was by far and away the best conference I've been to. And then the New Frontiers in Brackish T cell was also absolutely excellent. But the one takeaway I had from this conference is that this was the first time in all these years that we had um, large oil companies that are now taking an interest in doing uh, uh, deep water desalination. And so we were getting presentations that where they were saying at 400 meters, there's little to no life below that level where brine can impact green life. But they were showing videos and, and uh, things where they are 
doing work at 14,000 meters. That's 10 miles down in, in, in the ocean. And they call it operating in the desert with water on top, where they are anchoring into the, the ocean crust, tons and tons of equipment that operate in the oil industry. But what they showed us, and I'd never seen any of this before, was going well offshore from the coast down uh, to anywhere from 10, uh, I'm sorry, 1,000 to 5,000 meters and putting in uh, <clears throat> trains of, of uh, desalination equipment. Imagine taking the roof off of our desal plant and just planting it on the ocean floor. And then the pressure is so high, they don't need electricity to desalinate the water. And as the brine comes out, it's having little to no impact on the marine environment. And if you look out toward the, the rest of this century, I mean, all the light bulbs were going off with me and I was just going and talking to other people. This is kind of the wave of what we're going to see, pun, in, pun intended there, uh, wave of what we're going to see in decades to come. And I literally I can see by 2040, 2050, we're gonna have some of these large operations off the coastal areas. And this is to get around all of the Coastal Commission restrictions, not only here in California, but other states and countries, um, fight against the environmentalists, things like that. And they can do it at a much lower cost in high volume. This is really exciting to see. Um, so if I may? Yes. <clears throat> so I, I actually do have a project at about 1,000 meters south. I will say there are life down there. There are marine life, and there are actually contamination down there too. So life is not, there are challenges. I think it's a very prominent, promising technology, but it's not as easy as the presentation makes it. Yeah, I'm not being dismissive. Because there, there, are, there are definitely a lot of ROD footage of life down at thousand feet, even deeper from NOAA. So yeah, it, there will be impact. Making it difficult for them, but regulators to monitor the life. The, the amount of brine that's being released in terms of the volume of uh, water is uh, a tiny fraction. Number two, um, Director Weed had a chance to talk with Joaquin Esquivel uh, morning of the first day about um, opportunities around Lake Del Val. I had an extensive discussion with Secretary Crowfoot after lunch. And during his presentation, he noted this absolute commitment on the part of the governor to expand ESAL in California by 2030. And uh, he said, they're going to expand by 30 to 40,000 acre feet by the end of by 2030. <laughs> and so I said, Secretary Crowfoot, we could, if you reoperate reservoirs up and down California, you could create half a million acre feet of new water supply including at Lake Del Val. We can open up some opportunity there. So he said, keep me apprised, be informed. If you need a broker to help out with anything, let's uh, let's talk. Um, <laughs> Assembly member Rebecca Bauer Cahan, who is just to the north of us, she is the chair now of the Assembly Water Parks and the Wildlife Committee. She was a, gave a very impressive presentation. And the lady is on top of every subject. You cannot catch her on anything. And um, uh, a remarkable young uh, assembly member. And uh, she's going places. I, I, it's just my opinion. <clears throat> I will also note that um, the, there was discussion about the Antioch brackish uh, water desal plant that's going in. So for 6MGD, it's costing $120 million for half of our desal plant, $120 million. Um, there was a company that is located right here in um, 
Los Altos that gave a very nice presentation from Radical. And they just received a patent in January for an exciting new membrane technology that um, looks like it has all kinds of possibilities moving, moving on down the road. Uh, I think that uh, there was a lot of other information here at this conference, and I would encourage all board members, if you get a chance next year, you learn a lot here and really see what's going on at a very high level in the industry. Leave it at that. Next is a report from Director Weed on the conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, federal Affairs, uh, what Mark Whitaker used to describe as 10 cup week. Go back to D.C. to looking for big money. Um, the ability to get in and out of Congress is still limited, so that the traditional tours were greatly restricted this time. People came to the group both at the all the states the, uh, building, which is near the Capitol, and where the Aqua has its offices, as well as the board, uh, National Governors Association, et cetera, and Fox News. Chance. Um, then. Uh, on to Capitol Hill, where we had um, meetings and uh, uh, a series of congressional representatives come to the um, Capitol Visitor Center and the St. Regis Hotel. We had a number of speakers. I would encourage us just, we have a specific proposal. Tom, contact the staffer on Diane Feinstein's staff named John Watt. John is Mr. Water. For um, California, got a standing ovation. Most have been dealing with the uh, with her office. He has authored many of the bills that have been proposed for water issues, particularly in California. So, um, if there are issues on with the federal government and need to have a conversation with the Corps of Engineers. The operation of the facility, you might well be someone who could put us in touch with the right person and have the ability to proceed. Thank you. Okay, the uh, third report is from me on the South Bay Engineers monthly meeting. We had a presentation on <clears throat> um, a proposal to reform government code 1090 which prevents A&E firms from providing both pre-design and design services on a public project. Um, so uh, legislation is being sponsored in the form of AB 334 uh, to avoid the current practice of barring A&E firms from participating on later phases of a public works project simply for having worked on an earlier phase. I have um, asked our government consultants to look into uh, this bill, not necessarily to sponsor it, but just to learn more about uh, how it affects our district. And uh, I've referred it to the uh, LICA committee so that Jonathan and Aaron can report there on what their findings are. But it was a very interesting presentation and <clears throat> This is not the first time uh, legislation has been sponsored, but um, <clears throat> it's been going on for close to a decade. But this is the first time where the FPPC is endorsing um, legislation because they are the, the place in the hourglass where everything is getting caught trap for months and months and the attorneys are just sick and tired of it at the FPPC because they end up approving most of these cases where districts like ourselves are asking do, does this would awarding these contracts potentially create a conflict of interest and we don't want to be sued so the FPPC has finally said um, there's so few cases where there is a conflict of interest um, especially an egregious, purposeful 
conflict of interest where somebody is uh, benefiting benefiting unrightly. So um, there's there's high hope that this time it will pass. My last report is on update on the Delta Conveyance Finance Authority. So I have attached a. Um, Marianne was very nice to prepare this document for me. Where is it? Oh, right up there. Okay. <clears throat> Get a lot of questions about who and what is this DCFA doing and who's on the board. And so just to make it clear, I asked our executive director because even I have a hard time keeping track. Um, and as the new president of the board, um, he gave a prepared, had this prepared for me um, so that it shows all 11 agencies that are members of the DCFA board. Um, three of our districts, ACWD, Metropolitan, and Santa Clara have board representatives, elected board members elected board representatives, and the other eight agencies all have a general manager or assistant general manager on our board. So I hope that gives a little bit better perspective of what I am dealing with on an entirely separate board <clears throat> where I'm interfacing with people, like staff, are deeply embedded in all these issues. And I have to tell you, I have spent literally hundreds of hours on the Delta Conveyance website. If you go there, they have a document center where you can look up literally anything you want on the project. And it is quite frankly, a challenge to be able to have an intelligent conversation with all these different people that are trained in the water industry. and. I, I like this challenge. It's, it's um, forcing me to become better at what I do and to be really well prepared um, for all of the uh, agenda items that uh, come up in our meetings. And I think I've gained respect from you know the broader group here, most of whom I've known since uh, our inception. We started off with we were one of the first three agencies, then we expanded quickly to five and seven and nine. Now we're up to 11. It's quite possible we are going to uh, grow by one or two additional districts uh, over the next year. From the back, second slide, I wanted to show where we are uh, because um, we don't often discuss this in our own public board meeting. <clears throat> it doesn't get really widely reported by the press either. But you can see on a number of things uh, on field work, we're at 100% completion on the project. We're at the midway point on a lot of other segments. And uh, the draft, uh, the comments on the draft EIR are doing by the end of this month was they had a 90 day extension, but they had before 120 day extension. So we're moving into uh, issuance of the final ERR, EIR this summer, and that will allow the design and construction authority to go into final design. And then maybe as soon as later this year, uh, start on construction. Uh, certain elements of this project. So it's it's coming to fruition. Uh, and uh, the Delta Conveyance Finance Authority is in charge of the largest project in the country right now at $16 billion of financing. And my estimate is that this is probably going to double in size. It's uh, the project is the equivalent of building the channel between England and France. And um, it's, it has the same challenges. And uh, so um, when I say I have my hands full, I mean it. 
this this really is big time stuff. So that's my report on the DCFA. If there's any questions, um, I would welcome them after um, the meeting. And uh, are there any other director comments? I actually have an agenda item request. Please. I would like staff to consider bringing an item to the board on removing the drought surcharge. Specifically, I'm looking for financial analysis. I understand our water supply outlook is still kind of fuzzy by early April or second week of April. But I think we all recognize that a big portion of our drop surcharge is to make up the difference in our financial shortfall from, not, from the 15% conservation. And I know there were discussions from other directors that we have over collected. I think it behooves us to basically do a presentation to our public, do an evaluation to see do we need to continue this drought surcharge? And if not, we should consider removing it. But if there is a good reason presented next month why we should continue the drought surcharge, then so be it. So it's more of a two part the analysis do we still need it financially? And if we do, if we don't, then considering removing the future. So that, that's what I have in mind. And I welcome the board's, my fellow directors opinion on that. Uh, well, I'll, I'll second the, um, well, I'll reserve my comment. Sure, that's that's really all we need on uh, the board rules indicate, you know, two directors. Uh, support it too. We got three plus perhaps. Okay, yeah, and staff uh, certainly has no problem with that at all. So what I'm hearing is a request for an item to consider rescinding the drought surcharge, but supported by a bit of a presentation, really reviewing the financial aspects of, uh, of that issue. Uh, and then we can turn it to the board for some direction. Sound about right. Okay. Thank you. I wonder if our staff has any questions because now is your time. I, I have one question. I could be wrong on this, but I thought the last time that we ascended the drought surcharges was based on a governor moving the declaration of drought. Are we dependent upon that? It's a great question, and we can get into that at that item, I will just tell you just uh, briefly, um, we're not, our drought surcharge is not dependent on that, but it is informed by that. And we can go into the details a little bit more. As Mr. Ash pointed out, our water supply situation hasn't really changed that much. However, um, we can all look out the window and see that the future is likely to change things a little bit too. And And I appreciate the emphasis on the financial situation. So, that's what we'll focus on. By the way, yesterday I was passing Mission San Jose High School and they have a prominent sign right on Mission Boulevard messaging it said severe drought, save water. We appreciate all the support we've had from so many entities throughout our service area. And of course, our customers who, as you also saw in Mr. Ash's presentation, are still conserving uh, at about the highest levels through the drought. So. So we will be happy to bring that item back next month. Thank you. Decided I'm going to go over there and give a presentation to the Associated Student Body <laughs> about our water situation. Anyway, are we now ready for a closed door session? We are ready if the board so is I'll ready. I'll turn it over to our general counsel to inform us as to what we're doing next. Great. It's now 824 and the board is going to convene into closed session pursuant to California government code section 54956.9 subsection B2 conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation, one potential case now convene into session. And I'll just mention for the folks on the line that feel free to hang on if you'd like to um, hear the board report out of closed session um, um, or you feel free to log off and watch the video later. So, yeah, I think we're ready now. Okay. I have some.
10.07 p.m. All right, and, and I will provide the report. So the board convened in closed session pursuant to California Government Code Section 54956.9, subsection B2. Conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation, one potential case, no action was taken in the closed session. Session report. Thank you. And uh, any other issues to be brought up before the board? Okay, we will adjourn at uh, 10.08. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Nishimura, for hanging in there.